Hello, everyone. I'm Milas. I'm a software engineer here at Docker. I'm on the Compose team, one of the maintainers. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some tips and tricks to improve your Compose experience today. So before we get started, um, I've used Compose for actually quite a long time. Um, I've only been at Docker for about a year and a half, so I've used it uh, for you know long time before then. Um, and I'll be honest, I've had great experiences with Compose, and I've had terrible experiences with Compose. Um, it is, I think, one of the most powerful things about Compose is how simple it is to get going. Um, you know, I'm biased because I work on it all day, but I can write a quick Compose file to get some services up and running in a few minutes. Um, versus I also use Kubernetes a lot and love Kubernetes as well. It takes me a little bit longer to get going there, especially if I'm starting something new. But one of the really powerful things about Compose is that it can also really grow with you. So what I mean there is that you can expand the complexity of your project. So I'm going to show you some things today that are maybe a little weird and crazy, or and, you know, and maybe you look at them and you're like, why would you ever do that? You don't have to use them. I want to kind of give you some, some different tools that maybe are helpful. Maybe you see this and you think, oh, that's what I'm missing for my project. But again, do what makes sense for your project. It's, there's no one size fits all. Um, and then lastly, we're going to go a little bit all over the place. Um, it's going to be a journey. We're going to go from YAML to build to dependencies. We're going to be everywhere. Um, so, you know, buckle in. I hope that if nothing else, you see something out of this. You think again. I didn't know Compose could do that, and you can go and you know look in our docs or come and find me, you know, at the booth or Slack or wherever in the community Slack and say, can we talk about this more? So, let's go ahead and get going. First thing I want to talk about is Docker Compose config. Now, you might have seen this command. You might use it. Um, this will give you out the fully kind of rendered, templated version of your project in YAML by default. You can also get it in JSON, um, which is useful if you're integrating with an, another system where you want it as JSON or you want to use JQ on the command line, for example, to extract something out. Um, I use this a lot, especially when I'm reproducing bugs that get reported, uh, because it's a really helpful way just to see what, what is going to happen with my Compose project. Because you might have environment variables, and this will have the rendered version of the environment variables after substitution in there. Um, you might be using new features like include or extends. You'll see, again, what is the result of that? What does it look like? And you also have a bunch of flags to help you. For example, there is a dash dash quiet, where it will just exit code zero if it can parse your file and everything is good. Otherwise, you'll get an unsuccessful exit code. So you know, for example, you can use it as a quick CI check does my compose file still work with my configuration? Did I remember to put default environment variables in my M file for everything that's required? Um, there's also some other interesting flags you might not have ever seen here before. For example, we've got the dash dash images flag you can use, which will print out the list of all of the images inside of your compose file. There's even dash dash services, all of the service names. Again, really useful if you're maybe integrating with you know, another script and you want to see uh, just what have we got in here? What's in the Compose file? So there's a lot of interesting options, and this is just a great go-to when you're struggling with something or you, know, you don't even know, did I mess up the indentation in my YAML? Run a Compose config. It's a quick way to see, get it out in the terminal, and know what does this project look like. Um, sort of continuing with the debugging theme here, Compose up dry run. So dry run is a new, a pretty new flag we added, compliments of Guillaume, who's hiding in the back here. Um, and it actually works on commands more than beyond up. It works on essentially every command. How useful it is on some commands varies because there's some commands where you can't really do much uh, without actually doing the work. But again, this is really helpful if you've ever wondered, am I about to recreate a service when I run up? This you can run this with dry run. It's going to, it will talk to the engine still. It will communicate with the API, but it's only going to do sort of non-destructive operations. So it might look at what volumes are there, what networks are there, and say, oh, I would need to create this new network. And it'll tell you, but it's not actually going to do it. So it's another just really helpful tool um, when you're working, especially if you're iterating on your Compose project, or you've just made a bunch of changes and you're kind of afraid what's going to happen if I run up, you know? You can kind of just get a quick confidence. And again, this does work on other commands. Um, you know, so try it out. It's pretty universal. You can also put it, I put it here after the up. You can also put it before the up, after Docker Compose, wherever is easiest for you, kind of especially for scripting. Sometimes it's handy. Again, you can just, you know, up to your last command in the terminal and add dash dash dry run and run it again and see what happens or delete it from the end. So um, from there, I want to move over a little bit to build now. We're still sticking in the up frame, in the up, sorry, the world of up. 
but up has the build flag. So by default, when you launch up, if Compose already has a copy of the image for a service, it will not rebuild it because there already is a local version. So this will ask it to instead say, hey, rebuild all of my services that have build sections when starting to make sure they're up to date. If you're using, if your Docker files are well optimized and you have uh, you know, good layer caching and multi-stage builds and stuff, you're still getting the build cache here. So this is gonna be fast. It's not saying like a no, you know, it's not like a Docker build no cache where we're saying start from scratch, ignore everything. Um, we're just saying normally Compose will look in the engine store and if an image is already there, it's already built it, it said, oh, I already built this, let's launch it, I'm not gonna rebuild it. If you want it to rebuild, you can always ask it. So particularly with development, this is really helpful. And now you might be saying, well, that's kind of annoying. I don't wanna have to say dash dash build every time. I know my service has a build section, I just want it to build when I run up. And that's why we have pull policy build. So it's a little bit strange you're saying pull policy build doesn't really make sense. Yeah, it's a little bit funky. So by default, the pull policy for a service is what we call missing. Similar to what I described for build, if you have an image you're referencing, if it's not there, it'll try and pull it. There's also pull policy always. That's really helpful, for example, if you're using a latest tag or a branch reference, for example, you can say, hey, every time I up, I want you to pull down that new image. I want you to find the latest version and use that because I want, I'm integrating with another team, I'm using their service, I always want the latest version of theirs, um, and that makes sense for me to not pin to a specific digest, for example. So pull policy build is sort of similar to that always, but for services you build. It says, no matter what, run my build section for this specific service. So here in this little miniature YAML example, I have a web service, I have a very small build section to say use the current directory as context, but I've set pull policy build. Notice because it is the pull policy, it's not actually in the build section, it's in the, it's in the service itself. Um, and so this will mean when I run compose up without any flags, it's always going to trigger a rebuild of this service. Once again, you get all of the great things that Docker build offers you with the caching. So this can be super fast, um, especially if you've set things up in your Docker file for incremental rebuilds. So it's just another really helpful way um, to kind of configure your project based on what you need, especially when you're developing, to say every time I run Compose Up, I want you to build things and I want, and I want new versions of everything so I know my development environment is up to date. Um, so other build things you can do that are interesting. Now we're gonna start getting weirder. We get weirder as we go through here. So again, stick with me. We've got SSH options in build. So you might have used this on the command line with Docker build. You can actually pass and, and forward an SSH key or from your SSH agent. And so Compose also supports this. Um, this is really, really powerful, especially if you're working in a business setting because I think pretty much everywhere I've been at some point, I have the use case where I need to get a private dependency from another team's Git repo. You can do this with NPM, you can do it with Go, you can do it with, pretty much every framework or language has the concept of use Git dependencies, and that often ends up being a way that we integrate with each other. Um, and for better or worse, SSH is usually the authentication mechanism there. And so we wanna make sure that that's easy to do securely across Docker build and in Compose. So the way that you do that is that in your build section, you have this SSH key, um, the SSH field, and it takes a list. You can provide multiple SSH keys if you need to to your build, because you might actually have pulling from different sources. Maybe you're getting something from GitHub and something from your internal GitLab, and you need two different keys. Um, so you can do that. The default is a special one in, the, in Docker build, which uses surprisingly your default key. Um, and then when you actually, in your Docker file below, the way that you use that is a special mount type that's SSH, you use that same ID, and then you can run the operation. If you're not gonna use default in your compose file, if you actually need to use a specific key or path to a key, I would recommend using an environment variable there so that you can maybe, uh, so that each user, each developer can specify that right path to the key. Um, so instead here we could have, you know, my key equal dollar key path, for example, and then you would define that environment variable and that way your compose file is still portable, but each developer can put in their SSH, the path to their SSH key if needed. Default is usually, uh, works pretty well for most cases. Um, it's what I prefer, but again, different cases call for different things. Um, so last thing on build here, before we move on to, to other topics, is Docker file inline. You can write a Docker file in your compose file. I'm certainly not suggesting that you stop writing separate Docker files and move everything into your YAML. 
Um, but I've given an example here that's you know, sort of a, a, a small one where maybe I have a static folder that I need to get into Nginx. I don't need a really complicated Docker file for this. I just want some, I just want some files being served so I can write a little snippet in my YAML. Maybe I'm programmatically generating the YAML, for example, and this can be a, a way that you can come in and put it in or override, for example, if there is a Docker file in the repo in the context and I don't want to use that and for whatever reason I also can't create a new one, I can put it in line. So once again, it's another option to kind of help you here with being flexible, whatever you need, um, to, to support all, all the different use cases that you might want. So, Again, I know I'm going fast and we're all over the place and we're in build and now we're about to move to dependencies because we're just gonna keep going and jumping. So dependencies. This is one of the most popular parts of Compose, I think, one of the best parts when you launch to be able to have the, a basic pipeline of your services coming up. So by default in Compose, you might have seen before depends on. You might have actually just passed a list of services rather than using keys here as I am. So I have an API service that's using a database. I'm using Postgres because Postgres is amazing. And I want my service, my API to not come up until Postgres is not only started, but healthy. It's passing the health check. That's the health check that's defined in its Docker file, or it could be defined in Compose YAML as well. Uh, the official Postgres image already has a health check, so I didn't need to redefine it here, but you could if you needed to. So service healthy is a really uh, useful thing there to say wait for that service to start and pass its health check before you start me. This is a Compose feature. This actually just came up in our, in our AMA before. This, is, this applies at the time that you're doing up. Once the containers are running, if, um, if things start restarting or being recreated after that, this condition is not going to apply. This is Compose applying the condition when you run it up, it's deciding when to create things. Once it's been created, it's been created. Um, the, another condition that's, the default condition by the way is service started, it just means that the container has been created and started but we don't know if it's healthy. There is also a condition for service has exited successfully. So we could imagine here that I could actually add in another layer where maybe I have a job that's going to uh, set up my database schema or seed it with some test data. So that's gonna be a task that's gonna actually run to completion. So I would have that service depend on Postgres being healthy, and then my API depend on that seed job actually running and completing successfully. And now I have, with just a few lines of YAML, I've made it so when I run up, my database starts, it becomes healthy, my seed job runs, it puts in data, sets the schema, everything it needs, and then finally my API service actually starts. Other things you can do, it depends. Again, we're going fast, we're going. Uh, restart. I've used the same example here, but we've changed to restart. So maybe my API has an in-memory cache of data from the database. Um, and so when I recreate the database because I, I'm blowing away my environment or making changes, I actually want that service to restart. Again, this is a Compose feature at the time you're running Compose up. But it's a very, it's a, just a very simple way if you know that when some service is recreated that you need a dependent one to also be recreated because it's not going to handle that gracefully, this is a quick way you can do that that's very nice and it just makes it so that again, you kind of get, every time you run up, everything gets to the state that you want sort of automatically without you having to intervene or wait or say, okay, up this service, and then I watch the logs and wait a little bit, okay, I think it's good, up this other service and kind of go back and forth. This gives us the ability to actually define it in our YAML to say, I want, the, I want my API service to be restarted whenever I run Compose Up, and that Compose Up causes my dependent, the service I depend on, the database, to be recreated as well. Um, so it really, it really just gives you that flexibility. Um, and lastly on dependencies, we have required. This is, this is pretty new. So by default, dependencies in Compose are required. If you try and launch and it can't find the service you depend on, which there's different reasons that might happen, it will fail. And it, so in the previous example, if I tried to launch my API service and the database service wasn't defined, it would say, I depend on the database service and that's not being launched, I don't know where it is, we can't do it. That's not always what we want. The example here I've given is I'm using Jaeger, which is a distributed tracing tool. Um, so I've actually given it a profile so that, which means in Compose, that service is only going to launch when I have the tracing profile active. When I have the tracing profile active, 
I do want my other service, my app service, to wait for Jaeger to get started because it's going to start sending tracing data there right away. So I don't want to miss those traces when I start, but also I might not always run with Jaeger. I'm not always doing distributed tracing, kind of like you don't always run with an interactive debugger attached, but sometimes you might want to. So in the past, if you tried to set up this dependency, you would be in a catch-22 where either you have the dependency and then it complains the service doesn't exist, or you don't have the dependency and now your things aren't starting in the right order. So required false is really helpful for this situation. Another use case might be if, you have a, if you're using a lot of multiple compose files and merging them, overriding with include and variables. Again, it can give you that to say, if this thing is present, I want to have a dependency on it. And I can, again, I can use those things we just saw, like condition. I want to wait for Jaeger to be up and healthy. If it exists, but if it doesn't, it's not required. So if it's not there, it's not present in our project configuration as it is right now, then that's okay. We will just, we, we don't need it to operate. If it's there, we want to wait on it. If it's not, that's fine. So once again, we're going fast, we're moving, and now we're going to keep getting weirder, and we're going to talk about YAML anchors. Um, YAML anchors are a controversial feature for many reasons. They are a language feature of YAML, the YAML specification. So you can use them with Compose. Compose itself has many other, often more ergonomic, sort of domain-specific ways of doing, of reducing duplication in your configuration with things like extends and include. Anchors are really useful when inside of a Compose file, if you have a set of common fields for some object that you want to use. Most often, in my opinion, that ends up being environment variables. So it looks a little crazy. What we have here is we have our, for app, we have the environment. And then you'll see this less than, less than, star, common, env. So that's a reference to a YAML anchor, which is defined a little bit below on that x common env object. And we have some fields there. And what this is telling, again, this is a YAML feature, is to merge, is to merge these together. Um, I also have that Postgres user in the first one, so that will be an extra key. So if we actually look at what this looks like, if I run that handy config command, you'll see that now we have sort of the merge set of those two for this service. So again, if you have a really common set of environment variables, for example, that you need to use across all your services, this can be a good way to reduce that duplication. Um, and if you're wondering that x dash, that's a, that's a Compose specific um, feature, which is that Compose by default is strict with fields. If it doesn't know about a field, it will return an error. Um, and that's to prevent fields getting used before they're official and then having compatibility problems later. So x dash is the escape hatch, which is sort of the user namespace or extensibility namespace. So anything that's prefixed with x dash at any level of your Compose file, Compose will ignore. It will allow to pass and you can use it as needed. Um, so that's why here I've defined this object in my YAML that's x dash because Compose itself is going to ignore that key, but the YAML language feature is going to allow me to do that merge, which is why when I ran the config here, we don't actually see that X object anymore. It's now gone. A Compose specific feature here is reset. This is sort of similar uh, to when you're, when you're merging multiple files in different ways. So I mentioned Compose has more ergonomic fun functionality for combining files in some cases. So when you use multiple Compose files, by default for maps, we merge them. So if you have a field, you'll add in the new fields. If any fields are the same, we replace them with the value from the override. For lists, we append to the list. Usually this is the behavior, behavior that you want. It does cause problems in some cases. For example, if I want to get rid of a list, if I define an empty list, well, appending an empty list to another list is a no-op. Same thing if I try and have an object that I want to clear out that entire field, having null, is the same as just not having defined the field. It's, it's too ambiguous. So this, this YAML tag, exclamation reset, is a compose specific tag which says clear this field. So I have here a compose file on the left where I have at my app service with its build configuration, there's some options in there, and I have a port map. I then have an override file. In that override file, I've now defined an image because I don't want to build. So I want to get rid of that build section entirely. I also don't want the ports anymore. Maybe port 8080 is not available on my machine. I, I need to get rid of that port mapping. So by using the reset, I'm able to actually tell Compose, 
delete this field when you merge. You'll see after the reset, the null and the empty, the bracket bracket, empty list, that's actually just kind of syntactic sugar to make it clear what's happening. They don't actually mean anything there. Um, it, the only key part is the exclamation point reset, which says clear this out. We want to get rid of this field when we override. And so again, this is the result of it. We've deleted that build field, we deleted the ports, and we added in the image field. So it became very small, and that's, that's where we ended up. So again, we've seen a lot of weird stuff, and now we're going to go into experimental stuff, so it might get even stranger, and we're going to keep jumping around. So I appreciate you sticking through this. So Docker Compose Alpha Viz. This is a really exciting, uh, community contribution we got that, use, that will generate a graph viz visualization from your Compose project with the dependencies and networks. If you're wondering what the heck graph viz is, it looks like this when you output it. You can make it look in lots of different ways. This is using one of the awesome Compose samples for an elk stack. So we have Elasticsearch with which uh, Kibana and Logstash both depend on. And you'll see we've got, we can see in our little graph, I've configured it to output the ports and the networks. So it's a really cool, another way to visualize your Compose project. Maybe you want to stick this into your wiki, for example, from your project to help new people. Um, it's a really cool feature. Also very exciting was, you know, a community contribution, um, which is always, always great when we get, you know, really cool features like this from people. Um, and then I want to talk about tracing a little bit. So I mentioned that whole Jaeger thing earlier for distributed tracing. If you're not familiar with distributed tracing, that's totally fine. Compose and actually most of the Docker ecosystem and Mobi ecosystem have been adding support for distributed tracing across the tools. What this allows you to do is actually see kind of the insides of what Compose is doing and even see that as it goes across to Docker build for BuildKit or to the Mobi engine for actually starting the containers. You can see the whole picture here of how your project is being created and built. So this is an experimental feature right now. We're in the experimental section. Um, so you do need to enable it with this flag, compose experimental OTEL. Um, it respects the second environment variable there, OTEL exporter OTLP endpoint, is a standard open telemetry variable. You can look up their SDK. It supports different options. I'm sending here, this would be if I was running local Jaeger, I'm sending to my local machine. And then when you run compose up, it will see that and it will start reporting. And so we can see a screenshot, um, which might be a little bit hard to read the details on, but this is kind of what it looks like. Um, it might be familiar if you've ever used the network uh, waterfall tab in Chrome, for example, the interface. And so you'll see here we actually have compose specific actions here in this waterfall. We have the project up, we have the service apply. Um, within there, there's a lot of data you can see as well what compose files were being used, what volumes, networks, et cetera. So you can really see all of the data again in a, in a very different way. And you can use this data. There's a lot of tools and standard ways to ingest this. It's all open standards. So you could, for example, aggregate all of your build data and get an idea of your performance. How slow are my builds? What service is taking a long time? You know, we talked about that service condition ready. Oh, maybe you realize that my API service is taking a long time to start because it's waiting on another service to get healthy and maybe my health check is misconfigured. So it's a very, very helpful kind of debugging and insight tool. It's a little bit advanced. Um, we're trying to make it friendlier. That's why it's still kind of experimental. We don't have full coverage across stuff. Um, but I think it's very exciting. Um, you know, the industry has been adopting it large. And again, the Docker and Mobi ecosystems have been doing this um, and, and kind of adopting it across the board and integrating with each other. And we're hoping to keep improving that. And then to round things out, uh, I want to talk about include briefly. Now, hopefully, you got to see talk earlier about complex compose projects and learned about include and how you might use it, especially in a mono repo with multiple files. Um, it, to give you a little bit more context, it's a way to, to kind of import a sub project into yours. So you can help split things up. So now we're looking at extending that further. Include itself is GA, but we have experimental features within it. Here is the Git remote. Once again, you need to export an environment variable before it'll work right now. But it allows you to actually put in Git URLs. Um, and it can be SSH, it could be HTTPS, as I have here. And Compose will actually fetch that, clone it, and use it as sort of a sub-project within yours. Um, so if we go back again, maybe an example is maybe you have a common part of your stack. Maybe it's something like that distributed tracing I showed, where you don't want to copy and paste it across all of your Compose projects throughout your, your org. So instead, you can have a place for that common stack and then import it here. 
or maybe you have a team, you know, you have the authentication service that you need to use, and you can go and grab their Git repo and always get the latest version and build and do everything right there directly as part of your Compose project. Um, so it's, again, it's a pretty cool new feature. We're still learning about it and, and trying to figure out. We're also working on OCI support here, so you can do it with a registry similar, um, looks very similar, Compose Experimental OCI Remote 1 to enable it. Um, so definitely feel free to try this out, give us feedback. We're trying to figure out again, once again, to how to make Compose work and maintain that simplicity while we still grow to bigger, bigger projects and more complex projects. And then lastly, to round it out, we have x-develop as experimental, which is actually now developed because it's GA, so I cheated. Um, because uh, there will be a talk later on bind mounts, volumes, and Compose Watch, which is the feature of develop right now. So Compose Watch is a way to get live update within your containers. Um, so I've configured it here for a sort of JavaScript front end project where I want to synchronize my code in. Um, from whenever anything in the web folder changes, I want that to get into the slash app path inside of the container to synchronize. And then if I change my dependencies locally because I npm install something new, I actually want to kick off a rebuild of the whole thing. So Compose Watch is a pretty big feature, um, and we only have about a minute left here, so I'm not going to go into, into detail on it just now. But uh, do come to the talk later and do look at our, our docs here. Um, but this is a new feature. Again, it is GA as of Docker Compose uh, 4.24, which was released about a week ago. Um, so, and it's been there for a bit in experimental, but you know, try it out, use it with your projects. Um, it works, again, it's really intended to help give you a better development experience within the container. So, again, we went a lot of places. We went probably too many places across Compose. You do not need to use all of these features. I'm trying to, you know, Compose itself can do so many things. It's very flexible. It starts with you, it grows with you. So we're trying to help kind of give you an idea of some of, some of the things you might not have seen that might help you um, if you're getting stuck in some specific situation and you're thinking, I really wish I could, you know, this wasn't an issue that I could get my service to start in this way. Hey, check out dependencies. There's some new stuff there you might not have seen before that will help you. Um, but, you know, really, again, do what makes sense for your project always at the end of the day. Don't feel that you need to use a specific feature. Keep it simple. Grow as you need to grow. And have a great time and let us know what you like about Compose. And also, oh, come and visit us at the Innovation Lounge. All the, uh, the Compose team, we've got not all of us, but several of us are here. Um, we've got our manager, we've got PM. Uh, we would love to talk to you about any and all things Compose related or Docker related. But thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.